Part five. Very exciting. Mm. Coming near the end. Um, I don't know. I don't have a title. I don't have a working title for this one. <laughs> 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 What's this one about? <laughs> so, today, tonight, this evening, we're going to look at seven points, moments, activity spheres that David Harvey has outlined uh, claiming that he derived the theory from Karl Marx. Harvey calls it a co-revolutionary theory. Marx, well, (laughs) Marx doesn't call it anything from what I could see. Uh, But Harvey claims that Marx uh, called it a co-evolutionary theory. And it originates from um, when Marx was describing how capitalism as a social relation and a process flows through society, transforming it um, through these seven moments of society. We'll go into them in a minute. Um, and, and, And how each are... It have their own internal dynamics that's constituting themselves as an identifiable moment, but also are codependent. And when one changes, it affects all the others. But also, if another was to change, that really sort of reinforces the transformation of society in that given moment. Um, and the purpose of this is that. Uh, we're going to play a little thought game, one of two, the first of two. Uh, this one is to, because we don't know anything about it, is to imagine how um, capitalism rose from feudalism by by examining these seven moments, imagining what they were, what they became, and how they became it. And then next week, um, looking at them again, um, trying to outline what they are now, how they're identified now, or how they could be identified now, uh, what we would like them to be, what we would like them to look like, and how might we get to each to get to each one. Obviously I don't think you really get to them as such. But what sort of what sort of needs to happen and, and of course then we'll be drawing on all the other chats uh, to um to sort of to draw together a theory of change, basically, and uh, and that'll be our series complete. Very exciting. Do you want to go through them? Uh, yeah, sure. Just <clears throat> name them out. Um. So, me. Do you not have them a big um, poster so behind first... your computer? Uh, no, I have them on a small post-it on my computer. <laughs> Well, so. Because that's 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 that seemed like the cool thing to do. Apparently, once upon a time, you put a post-it feature on your computer. Um, I do love them. so. Yeah, <laughs> I like actual post-its. I just don't like ones that are digital. They just don't just work. get a word document. Um, <clears throat> technological and organ organ. I don't know that. <clears throat> Good technological and yeah, I'm going to start again. <laughs> Technological and organizational forms of production, exchange, and consumption. Relations to nature. Social relations between people. Mental conceptions of the world, embracing knowledges and cultural understandings and beliefs. Labor processes and production of specific goods, geographies, services, or effects. Institutions institutional, legal, and governmental arrangements, and the conduct of daily life that underpins social reproduction. I love the way you read that out. It was like a quiz master <laughs> doing categories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> so these, uh, these, these can be found in two rather large essays um, by Harvey. Uh, we'll post the links below. Um, as good as the 
essays are it's down at the bottom of each where where these are talked about in terms of the co-revolutionary aspect his his theory um is to is using marx's co-evolutionary theory of how capitalism um moves through these moments um to sort of suggest that well these are seven moments in our society that if we were ever to work politically on sufficiently um that we would change society um they the two essays i suppose um they're all they're all they're all based on the work he was doing at the time i think it's around two yeah 2011 uh and all put in his book enigma of capital um very good read and uh, i think i think there's I think chapter five in that book goes into the co-evolutionary aspect of it. And then chapter eight might be the final one, um, goes into the revolutionary possibilities going forward. Um, because we know nothing about history, we did have a quick look. I had a quick look at uh, Ellen Meeks and Woods, the origins the origins of capitalism and um i think i got the two book titles right this time first time um <laughs> i was hoping to find in uh woods origins this co-evolutionary theory that harvey talks about that marx outlined but um she doesn't really uh however i think there's enough in there that I'm going to be able to hopefully catch um, any wayward tangents from our thought game, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> sufficiently enough. And come on, okay, yes, we're wide open here for enormous amounts of criticism, but like, just go with it. <laughs> yeah. Just go with it. It's, it's how Who we knows? Learn. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is how we learn. Exactly. Uh, like we're, it's how we learn. We've, we're not professing to be preaching here are we i mean as far as i'm concerned this is this is an educative process these chats yeah. um that we for us especially but that's what i meant that's what i meant <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was the process part yeah yeah um i don't know yeah okay so shall we go through each one then individually um yeah i think i think it's a good start because there's definitely i mean you know, coming at it from a perspective of, um, like, if I were to sit down and look at these as a list, completely fresh eyed to the even the concept, and I know that you were saying that it was a little, little murky about when and even if Marx actually talked about these things or about this this kind of this this um, structural concept. Um, yeah, there there are some that obviously. Uh, obviously i think stand out as you could go ah okay yeah i can sort of you know if you've if you've at all kind of uh, studied either um i suppose well in general literature uh, surrounding capitalism or even anti-capitalist movements or at least attempts thereof um there's stuff you could pick out instantly like my mind instantly jumps to very um some of the spheres and goes ah, i can associate a, a, a movement or a moment or an attempted um so like form of social change around those uh, around those things but yeah by going through them one by one i think yeah some of them are i guess stand out to me as being a little bit more not vague but a little bit more dense uh so if we go through them one by one it might just i don't know help us flesh them out and then make it more of a, a, a an overview afterwards perfect that sounds sounds good should we kick off with A? Yeah, I think it's always a good place to start. Yeah, this is this is probably well after I'm not gonna make that point. Technological and organizational forms of production, exchange, and consumption. Um so we're that was the best to sort of take take each point in its in in any given static form or to just sort of describe to go through each point in terms of its alternate possibilities um i mean technological and organizational forms of production exchange consumption i think um obviously is 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 um 
capitalism <laughs> is, the, yeah. is, is the strongest sort of the most associated with capitalism, I guess. Um, you, you, you split this one sort of in two really. Uh, and then again in other constitutive parts. So it's like, it's technology and organization. Um, how society is organized and what technology is at that society's hands or at hand to that society. And then, and then in the second um, half of the split, uh, looking at constituting society, production, exchange and consumption, and then as, as different parts themselves, um, how is production organized and what technology assists that organization how is exchange organized how is consumption organized so um in maybe maybe just just as a standard example i don't think we should follow this all the way through with all of them but like just looking at now uh to sort of illustrate how we're treating these things um so i mean the technological and organizational forms of production or society today are, are sort of enormous, but like um, you, you, you're talking about things like the, not only, a, not only does that involve the, the conversation around automation um, and also uh, like also sort of a, a dense consideration of the, the, the current history of automation um but not just automation but also what technology has enabled us to sort of develop and produce um but in terms of its organizational forms how how is production organized increasing globalization um chains of production um with one product having gone through a series of different geographic locations across the entire world before it becomes a product um the, uh, with the virus at the moment when 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 lockdown kicked off there was a there was a big um a big issue about our our um lines of um food distribution uh, and production like are we in any given moment three days away from if production collapsed do we only have three days worth of food for any given country something like this whereas apparently but like before it might have been sort of well you'd have of course you'd have like a a winter's harvest um that would do you for most of the year i guess um then exchange obviously is the big one for capitalism um the internet fiber optics and the, the, the quicker the internet gets that, like I, I can only assume we're talking micro nanoseconds uh, in terms of having having an advantage on a competitor. Uh, I hear about whole um, whole high rises being hollowed out and just being inserted with servers and like cable lines um, to make like the internet just like just that second quicker so that a sale can be made uh, uh, not a sale but like an exchange uh, in terms yeah. of in terms of um probably not commodities currencies you'd imagine yeah i was about to say the 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 ability to transfer currency um to and from a a and b uh would probably be a, yeah you know it's 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 a huge like if we're talking things like nanoseconds yeah it, it they you stand to benefit from being able to move sources of currency well, there you um, go. around as quick as you possibly can um and, and consumption so obviously mm. what do we consume i mean daily goods again the sort of lockdowns bring that painfully to our consciousness uh, whereas we took it for granted beforehand but um the way the way that's being organized or the way it had been organized uh, is obviously particular to our time uh you kind of think of the post-war america 1950s style um where supermarkets really sort of took hold and this this sort of market delivery system was a a sort of um an organizational novelty that that really still defines 
our time now um, with sort of many quirky offshoots from it in terms of like vending machines and uh, <laughs> just you know like the, the main the point there is that of course we're not living in 1950s America uh, with the same sort of supermarkets they have but it's 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 still the sort of the, the ontological um, form of um, consumption of that good type um, and I mean, so yeah. As as an example, uh, this uh, particularly safe because we started in in modernity there or in late modernity. Um, trying to imagine the organizational form for production, exchange, and consumption, and the technological, the technological resources, directions, and applications uh, in terms of all of those three things sort of like well what what do we want in terms of production what do we want in terms of exchange what do we want in terms of consumption um you know obviously there's 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 many on the left um that would that would uh criticize overconsumption as being sort of a, like a like a manifestation of of capitalist capitalism capitalist lifestyles um whereas there's 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 a valid shout well actually no that's not the case uh, why why as long as we were respecting nature why does consumption as long as production was respecting nature within within our natural limits why would any amount of consumption equate with you know this this the trope of bourgeois living uh, sure. it doesn't necessarily and that, i suppose that's that's where um the whole idea of um fully automated luxury communism comes from or not comes from but is about um cons- consumption first of all there's very little from the consumer end from the demands demand end that you can do as as a consumer like our um our ability to change things is constantly undermined by the market you know um i have a horrible sneaking suspicion that amazon is killing it at the moment in terms of random things people are using their sudden surplus money in lockdown on oh yeah absolutely i mean there was a there was that that sort of like I don't know. I don't know. I, it was never. It was never a headline. It was never a social media. It was never a tweet. Never an anything. But there was definitely the the kind of tagline that Amazon were um, prioritizing medical supplies at one point. But I gotta say, like I've seen, I, I, I've seen plenty of uh, plenty of deliveries around here, and and it's been boomerangs and oh, <laughs> stuff for boomerangs. people to people to 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 chill out on i i you know i i didn't see any uh i can't imagine that they're not doing well at it as you said spending up a bit the, of surplus cash on on means to keep themselves occupied the reason the reason is that it's like in terms of power relations that i was getting at is that it's very difficult it's not just because we're bored and we've got extra cash all of a sudden it's that well if you're lucky enough to still have a job, of course, and not be furloughed. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's the, it's the sort of the, the, the cheapness, the, the sort of the deals that like the market can provide that sort of undermines the ability of a consumer to really make decisions. Like you, you've got to be pretty rich and wealthy to be in a position as a consumer to sort of really have the power of choice in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's my point. So, um, mm-hmm. the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're trying to imagine what what modes of consumption. Okay, so it's an internal. It's that, that I was getting at there. It's an internal discussion, but it's probably not a very necessary one among the left. I mean, internal to the left, like what should consumption mm-hmm. look like? But, um, but I think ultimately, if you really, if you really talk through the the issue uh there's enough there's enough sort of limitations that lie totally 
elsewhere, like respecting nature, that um, that would result in going, oh yeah, okay, so we can fucking consume what we want as long as it's not consuming the actual planet and the air we breathe uh, in, an, in, 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 a, in a definitive, fatal way. Um, and, go on. I was just going to say, and I guess, I mean, similarly, I mean, uh, I mean, with regards to also, I guess, the production itself of how these commodities, how the, sorry, luxury items, um, how they're produced, um, you know, the, if for example, uh, well, I mean, you know, topically, if we talk about say Amazon's, Amazon's setup, um, you know, with regards to wanting to just, you know, if you can just, uh, pick up, pick up something off of Amazon that in, in a, in a, by a means of wanting to keep yourself, I guess, entertained um you know i guess in this 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 idea where you were talking about with regards to like there would be there there is the argument say coming from certain uh, certain uh factors of the left that would say you know well that's that's an inherent kind of conditioning of capitalism you just want to consume um you know i guess the well i guess the question i'm asking is like is it is it capitalist uh is it, is it in sort of inherent capitalist logic that makes me want an iPhone? Um, yeah, that's, sure. that, that's the consumption. But am, yeah. I, am I okay <laughs> with buying an iPhone if, say, for example, the, um, sorry, there's no branding, uh, just a, a, a smart device. Um, if, for example, the, the actual production, and as you said, the production itself with regards to labor, uh, with regards to the, or the way that the production is organized, uh, with regards to who is ben- who is benefiting uh, mm-hmm. from this, or is anybody like you know, uh, well benefiting in a much grander grander scheme? Um, and as you said, the relationship to to nature in this regard, how much of an impact is it having? How much of does that impact affect people around it? Um, you know, are people you know is it is it okay if uh, you know to want an iPhone as long as you know the people. Uh, from the company as a co-op and aren't afraid to go to work <laughs> sick uh, or are fairly treated and uh, are making an effort in order not to uh, leave a destructive impact in the environment and people around it. Yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah, that's the consumption point. It's that, it's that um, it absolutely isn't capitalistic to, uh, to want to consume. Yeah, yeah. In an ideal situation, uh, the the production has no lasting negative impact on the um, and either society or the environment. Uh, but also, currently, as it does, uh, I think we've got to understand. And again, this is the sort of the how the marketplace undermines the consumer. Uh, people are fucking. We're not well in the head. <laughs> we're unhappy, and. Mm consumption fucking makes us happy and yeah that dopamine kick exactly don't we? we like yeah. fair play to people who sort of live outside of that um yeah. but by and large like the sort of worst offenders in 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 this category are the working class because their fucking laws are shit and it fucking feels good to shop when you're able to yeah. um so so to be to, to go against the spirit of what, we, what we're going to get at here, exchange, how organization, uh, how, how exchange is organized is, is pretty bloody key here. Um, because as we go on in this chat, it's, it's, um, it, it's the form of exchange that, um, that kind of really determines whether a society is capitalist or not. Um, I mean, yeah it's arguable that and this is the argument we're going to make every single point on this is is interdependent in terms of that being a key variable as to what determines a a capitalist society but um but exchange for exchange's sake is what distinguishes capitalism from anything else really uh you've got your use value and you've got your exchange value. And um, as soon as you get to a point somehow in society where you're not bartering or buying an item for its use value, 
but for its exchange value, then it's like you're running you're running an aesthetic. Um, I don't know how to describe it, uh, an aesthetic logic um, where it's it's just very particular to capitalism to 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 that because we we can make profit off exchange and you can make profit off exchange outside of capitalism but particularly like uh, you you think of like market um, not markets uh, financial markets financialization um swapping currencies like the, like the majority probably of exchange that happens in our society at the moment has no use value <laughs> whatsoever so it's not even the fact that like there's a the, at the end of the capitalist string someone gets something and takes it home and uses it and it benefits their life somehow but um the, the like the multitude and masses of of what's happening in in terms of excuse me um determining our society at the moment is exchange for exchange's sake because people are making money off it and like in the virus i think a few european companies went to um went to ban short selling short selling the right term i think so uh betting betting, betting, betting against the market so like um shorting uh, okay. the market right. uh and some some article in financial times was uh was just like oh but that's a part of the system so if you ban it, you actually destabilize the system. You don't stabilize it by banning it. And it's just like, well, that's like saying, that's like saying, um, we've got an issue with the diesel engine. It's killing the planet. And opening up the bonnet and going, oh no, no, if if you take out the, uh, if you take out the carburetor, the injection, fucking piston, whatever, I don't know. If you take that out, then the whole engine doesn't work. So you got to put it in. It's like, yeah, yeah, but my point is the engine. <laughs> it's not the engine isn't working. The engine's killing us. Yeah. You know, so it doesn't matter yeah. what component um, isn't is or isn't working or needs to be there. We want to fucking change it all. Get, get rid yeah, of it. it would be seen to be diffusing the whole situation. Then, like, because because for somebody that will be enough, and they'll go, oh, well, you see, <laughs> there, you need that piston injector. Is that um, is that real? You need thing? it. Like, injection? I mean, otherwise it doesn't work. And it's like. It yeah, it it creates uh, I guess it it hones or focuses in onto like the my the minutia um, as a I guess almost tactically um, if I was to put my conspiratorial hat on uh, tact tactfully um, or yeah tactfully to um, yeah I guess draw attention away from the grander um, or the the overarching um, what's the word on the contradiction of the whole thing Absolutely. it 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 is fucking broken <laughs> yes yeah yeah it, you, you don't fix it it could if, if itself is broken is what's broken exactly. uh, we are the engine yeah and it's not working for us yeah. um so that's so that's sort of an example um we'll we'll go much deeper i think i hope into um into determining those uh hypotheticals in two weeks time but i suppose for now uh let's take that continue with it and zoom in on merry the old england countryside 16th century feudal lords lands and ladies and sorry <laughs> i don't know why it's that <laughs> angle <laughs> ellen meeson wood mm. wrote a fine book and her argument was that quite often when people are discussing the how capitalism arose out of feudalism, they describe it in such a way. And in fact, even she argues in the book, quite a few Marxist uh, theorists, hist historians do the same thing um, to one degree or another. But it's very common to hear about how either wealth amassed to a point that allowed a certain class of people to be become um, to start behaving in a different way or tech technological developments allowed people to start behaving in a different way uh, however uh, 
Allen. Wood. I keep wanting to say woods, but it's wood. Um, wood locates the start of capitalism in agrarian rural England in the 16th century. Uh, outside of towns, nowhere near anyone, the, the original bourgeois, see, um, away from commerce, really. Um, not in France, not in Netherlands, wh- who all had like sort of high functioning economies. But their economies were still coupled with, with politics, with um, politics feudal politics being brutal uh, force quite often um, where peasants given the right to the land to work it um, allowed to do so by landlords uh, the landed gentry uh, because they would extract surplus labor so yeah you can you can grow that carrot for yourself but you've got to grow me too for the privilege of using my land because I'm a noble one. However, in England, there was a strange, the, the, the one unique aspect was that the, the landed, the landowning classes owned like large concentrated holdings, uh, unusually large for that time. And um, The, so not technology and not yet exchange or consumption but the organization of production because the lands were so large uh, the holdings the tenants on them um, basically there started to be the, the landlords were in such a position that they were able to extract instead of surplus value, surplus wealth. So um, money, money for rent, basically. Mm-hmm. And because this occurred, there developed a market in leases. So it's unusually large holdings of land. Um, somehow allowed landlords to start extracting money for rent from their tenants, sparking a, 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 like a, a lease market, which incentivized the what were peasants um, who became through their tenancy and their their monetary claim on a lease to begin competing for leases so if you've got one one farmer who figures out how to do something more efficiently all of a sudden they can go to the um the landlord and say i can yeah i can pay a bit higher for that plot of land uh than joe schmidt there can oh. and um and all of a sudden this is the moment this is um this sparks uh, like a, like a totally novel law of motion and the capitalist logic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the initial point there was that, uh, that historians often describe that it's a technological or a, an accumulation of wealth, uh, that, 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 um, that leads people to start behaving differently. Um, as if to say that, um, it provided a freedom for the individual to realize uh, an inherent capitalist impulse, an inherent human impulse that became known as capitalism. Uh, there's like there's a naturalism to it, um, right. an inherency, and that feudalism was uh, was su- suppressing it. So 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 say technology technology and the mercantile class uh, developed to a point where they they were able to overturn their feudal lords they, they got the upper hand somehow and then were allowed on the basis of that freedom from feudalism then this behavior which we now call or then at some stage called capitalism was able to flourish but yeah so returning to to that main to that the the, the point that skipped um 
that part there was that uh, yeah, it's a, th- this moment where the, the the lease the lease market in rural England in the 16th century kicked that law of motion off, and so it's it's there's nothing natural, there's nothing inherent, there's no freedom, there's not there's nothing that we dust off in in human history there, and and oh, this is what we're supposed to do, you know, this is this is a, this is an application, and um, and would um further distinguishes this um by saying while while trade and commerce existed before this moment and outside this moment beyond this moment before this moment spread um people could, people could still trade for profit uh you know that was that was happening all the time but it wasn't capitalism because that was an individual taking an opportunity in the market they saw something that was cheap knew someone else who valued it at a higher rate and pay the cheap price, sold it for a higher price, made a profit. Not capitalism. That's taking um, advantage of an opportunity. This situation back in rural England, when your neighbour is starting to somehow make more money than you in the marketplace, um, that you're that you're suddenly seeing those opportunities sort of diminish, and you've got to go back to your land to improve it somehow, to improve your technique, to improve, to 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 cut some corner, to um, to intern your farmhand instead of paying them, mm-hmm. um, whatever. All of a sudden, this this competition, the the threat of losing your land and your way of life to your neighbor um, who's out competing you at the marketplace for whatever reason. That's, that's the key moment, the law of motion, the capitalist logic that's, that's put in motion and becomes irresistible just because of the threat that it poses. Um, and landlords then saw this, uh, started making more, more rents off their successful capitalist farmers and encourage them and would work with them to uh to to sort of to keep this game going like yeah yeah this this what you did here i really like it <laughs> do it again <laughs> and and pushed it and like would have been would have been quite um would have been quite happy then to pay that person uh, or to let that to, to sell the lease to that person and displace the other tenant and mm. and on and on and on um so it's this organization of production and the um the relation of production um the means of production is the land in this situation and the producer is the farmer um the change then the organizational change is where that farmer is impelled. It's an imperative to compete. To 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 it. The relationship between the producer and the means of production is changed because all of a sudden the means of production and the process of production, that relationship, it's an imperative. I must I must I must nurture the relationship with with production with my productive processes with my means of production i must attend to it because if i don't i will lose my land and i will have to sell my labor to the successful dude or go into the town whatever and obviously you know um by 1850 40% of English people were living in towns, whereas at the same time in France it was 15% and in Germany it was 10% roughly. Um, So that, that, that sort of shows how far ahead in terms of capitalism, in terms of, and, and and this is what we mean when we're talking about capitalism. Um, Landlords loving it, getting more rent and no need for the, um, no need for coercion. Uh, the feudalism of of brutal barons knocking on your door for to ensure that you're working hard and given you're, you're giving them the two carts where well, you're in ticket one blah 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 um 
much more humane and and embedded in a sense of freedom so that's the organizational switch uh production was something that you sustained you and sustained your landlord but now production became uh, a competition mm-hmm. for life and death <laughs> essentially mm. and because of this this is the internal dynamic because of this techno technology did advance the like competition induces innovation so as soon as someone catches on to what you're doing you've got to go well how can i do it better and better and better um in, in terms of consumption like it's the, obviously the same the uh the other side of the same coin but um you've got you've got a in feudalism you've got the tenant growing food and consuming it in in the in the, in the relationship relations of subsistence whereas here you've got this growing growing wage labor mass and urban mass who are consuming in an entirely different way and the fact that um capitalism was able to this this new mode of production was able to feed them while they're not growing shit themselves is is quite significant um so in terms of actual exchange then whereas i started off saying it's exchange seems like the key thing for capitalism actually here i here i'm not so sure where exchange yeah yeah so i suppose it's exchange for for exchange's sake so that what what was valued before capitalism was use value what what becomes valuable after capitalism more and more increasingly is the actual the f- matter of of exchanging and hmm. um, so yeah that's i think i think that along one moment in society is um the transition from feudalism to capitalism what you think <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no it's it's curious so with regards to um just to just to clear up something for me um so with regards then to this kind of competitive, uh, I guess, yeah, this, I don't want to call it a foundation because I think I, it, it doesn't sound as intelligently, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, it doesn't sound as intelligently implemented, um, but maybe that's just my bias in like the sort of, uh, I've watched too, too many uh, to a manner born uh, period shows and uh, generally these kind of, Boardy. my my concept of barons and lords is half of them half of them were struggling to uh keep keep their their lives in check anyway and uh usually losing losing land in games of cards um which is my my uh caricature um but i guess yeah one thing that stands out for me is this the the the, the sort of i guess the inception of the concept of competition between the um uh, producers or farm farm folk at this point i guess like i'm just wondering if does it start to say for example as, as you said um during this period of time there might have been instances or sorry there were instances of um land be, larger quantities or or expenditures of land being owned than um sort of i guess in the eyes of a producer um that obviously means like maybe somewhere is starting to form at that point larger swaths of land available to you um obviously means you can perhaps start to elevate yourself slowly into this more enriched class that you see as owning the land um now there's essentially i guess a brick wall there that says you don't own the land yeah. so you're never going to quite get to the dinner table um but you can try your hardest yeah. um and this i guess something that stands out for me is that that inherent that inherent um competitiveness that might be devised between the producers not so much necessarily just oh, and sorry maybe maybe you, you did say this and i just didn't pick up on it um it drives those innovations that you were saying, you know, obviously 
you look at someone else and say, oh, shit, you know, they're, they're starting to do uh, not just necessarily the technological innovation where you look at somebody and go, wow, they're starting to do it this way because of this thing. I should get on that. Um, but I don't know, maybe the conceptions of how, maybe there's early conceptions of people sort of almost pitching to landowners like, hey, listen, I, I can, um, that guy makes you, the, gives you the carrots. That's all, you know, good and well. But, you know, if I had use of this extra yeah. bit of acreage i would start growing cabbages too um and this is my this is this is you know this is my family yeah, uh, yeah. You, you can have them work at the house um that i don't know if maybe it starts to form that kind of weird um competitive logic then amongst producers is like how can i not just innovate technologically but innovate with regards to absolutely in my important, my, my seeming importance. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I think, I think that's, I think that's social relations between people. Um, you've got like, um, I'm I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the sort of the book thing, uh, from now on. I think that's like, it'll come in and out, but that was the basis of it really there, the the kickstart of it. So Mm. yeah, so from, from here on in, that's just like, sort of freewheel on each point but uh cool. social relations are like yeah so i'd imagine in, in feudal times um the relationship between landlord and tenant was was quite brutal uh we certainly certainly seem to be when we were reading irish history um the because because the because it was it was it was extra economic means as wood puts it um the the extraction of surplus uh, labor or surplus wealth, whatever, um, which implies coercion. Um, this changes, and and what you're describing is exactly what I imagined when I was reading it. It's like um, I imagine this this sort of um, this buddy pal relationship developing with any one given landlord's like most competitive tenant, who probably ended up actually. You know, if if you've if if you've got five te- if if you've got eight tenants, one manages to be competitive enough to buy the second lot, then his competitive advantage over the the rest of the six, sorry, right? yeah, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. it, it is doubled. So by dislodging one, um, the, the likelihood is that that tenant is going to dislodge all the tenants all the other tenants and the relationship then um obviously the uh, well we'll get to that in a second but the relationship between the landlord and that tenant that capitalist tenant um mm. would probably be quite remarkable and i just imagined it like the really desperately condescending like no oh, this is my this is my little my little farmer my little potato man and uh, he makes me an awful lot of money and and him going yeah there yeah, make a lot of potato but like you know, th- there's a real bond there. There's like a sort of, um, uh, pro- probably sort of, uh, like weird, weird sort of awkward friendships, um, and and where they both where they're both playing a game like that. To, to to be a landlord, I would imagine, and having seen this happen, it's like they were, I had eight lads, and now I'm making way more money off only one of the lads being left, and the others are gone. And I don't really think about them, but this guy, wah, He's, he's a dynamo this is and it, it would become a, a game um an exciting mm. game probably um and 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 that that's where the bond would form and that mm. social relation um between capitalism and aristocracy essentially um mm. i know they weren't necessarily uh deadly friends across all of europe but um in that in that instance i'd imagine be quite pally um however of course <laughs> to uh to dislodge your neighbors in such a radical way like people who I th- from reading the book i get the impression that like there was a lot of village like normative customs were were quite prevalent and quite strong so like so like peasant society was 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 quite regulated but in a democratic way possibly in a communal way at least and um to have someone suddenly become a capitalist like that and to dislodge and disrupt all 
that dynamic in a, in a village in any given village and particularly when the landlord is backing them and using their at that time new parliamentary powers to support to, to basically get rid of any custom that stopped this new game once this game came up against a, a barrier like the, the commons mm. um <laughs> it was just like fuck off <laughs> get the fuck out of town we're we're playing this great game <laughs> and you're in our way <laughs> with your stupid commons walking through my goddamn woods. I fuck I'll fucking own the woods. I can do whatever the hell I want. Get out of the way. Um game on. <laughs> yeah. I, I I wonder about the kind of like yeah, like and maybe that I guess maybe this is more the, the sinister kind of uh the kind of sinister I'm not conspiratorial, but like the, the the kind of sinister mentality, the sort of the the lurking shadow uh, that is this kind of slowly forming logic that I, I sort of have in my head, the, the kind of caricatured evil, um, like this idea of not only just get out of get out of my commons. Who are you? Put that put that spinach back. That's mine. <laughs> um, yeah, put that back. Um, also, if you start not only like that, that that logic of dislodging that that you know that that farmhand essentially and kind of saying no 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 like you know I'm I'm making I'm making some good dollar out of you I'm making some good cash stay stay here I wonder what how that relationship develops in a, in the reversal of if there starts to become this kind of you know I guess like um, like soap bubbles like if the rest of the community does start to kind of say, no, 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 come like, come back and join the mass of soap bubbles because of, you know, all this great stuff we do as yeah. a community. Um, what incentive um, or what kind of, I guess, I guess what, what new rules to the game uh, would be built on the fly by landowners in order to kind of keep, keep asserting that, that dis, that dis, that, uh, that fracture. Um, between the farmhand and, and the rest of the, sorry, I shouldn't refer to it as soap bubbles. It was just the first reference that came to my head because of how they they seem to work. Um, but you, I'm, I'm sorry, am I articulating yeah, yeah. that well enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except like that, these aren't these weren't farmhands. These were these were tenants. These were all farmers, and mm -hmm. it was just it was just you know the the ones that became competitive became yeah. capitalist farmers. And sorry, I think ones... I just misused the term farmhand there. I think okay. yeah, farmhands yeah. are are workers on a farm, correct? Exactly. Not so a farmer. Yeah. They, cool. they they did actually then become farmhands because they were mm. dislodged from their tenancies and they lost their leases. Um, but yeah, sorry. Okay, so you meant the same thing. Um, from what I can gather, the legal and and this brings us this brings us to point F. Uh, institutional, legal, and governmental arrangements. From what I can gather, yeah. So the um, in terms of norms and uh, communal um, regulations, <laughs> what the fuck is the word I used a minute ago? They, 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 those institutions that that held peasant society together um, were obliterated. Um, the commons was an institution. And when the, a landlord had his new pal, his new capitalist pal, and they 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 maxed out what they had, and they were like, "Oh, <laughs> like you said, All right, that dude with the spinach." <laughs> and they went to um, you know, so I think in 1688 was the glorious revolution, and that's where the land. The landowning classes um, sort of began really shaping uh, society to to suit their agenda in England, um, and so perfect timing. They were able to sort of really um, where 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 judges or whoever, whatever the legal system was in in, in that that juncture uh, between feudalism and capitalism. Um, from what I can gather, you know those those rights and those um, customs, that was the word I was looking for, um, were strong. And it, like a, a judge would go, yeah, look, listen, this this peasant, is, as, as much as they're a peasant, they have a right. And um, and this is how our society is constituted and I'm gonna, I'm gonna rule in their favor. Um, however, 
because of the parliamentary arrangements after 1688, that began to erode and any, all the customs, the customs that got in the way, essentially, of this expansion of, of capital uh, were battered down um, by institution, legal and governmental arrangements. Um, and so I know, I know you're, you're, you're even talking a bit more normatively in terms of like um, what sort of almost peer pressure or um, like where the village is trying to negotiate with this situation. But I think the, the, the power of, of capital here in, in terms of transforming those villages probably was so powerful that like, you know, if, if they weren't humiliated enough to become, to, to move from being a tenant on par with this person to working for this person, then they were off to the town mm-hmm. and, and, and society was just sort of obliterated, just like divided up and communities just, I mean, this is, this is liberalism's first act of social dissolution. Um, which brings us to mental conceptions of the world, embracing knowledges, uh, not embracing knowledges and cultural understandings and beliefs. And I think um, uh, before reading it, I'd always sort of, I don't know why I never looked into it, but I always questioned whether sort of capitalism came from liberalism, like philosophy in the enlightenment. Was it like, well, this like was the logic of being a free individual is what led to capitalism or was it the other way around and it turns out john locke um at the time wrote what was it um his theory of property and it it went sort of along the lines of like look at this look at this new sudden freedom we've all got look what it's allowing us to do so he's witnessing everything that we're describing here and he goes, isn't this marvellous? Isn't this the best game ever? Um, we should all be free to do this. And starts, you know, kick roll, kick, kick starts the um, liberalism, philo- liberal philosophy in the Enlightenment. Am uh, <laughs> I witnessing this? So it, it, liberalism as a philosophy is born of, of this moment of, 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 seeing like um old religious feudal monarchical um state interventions always try to stop this person from doing this wonderful thing um but he but all all Locke was looking at was this this sudden flourishing like like this person just did this with the land Whereas for the last two bloody centuries, it was only growing three fucking carrots a day or a year or whatever. Mm. All of a sudden, it was like there's fucking millions of carrots. And that's exciting. And, um, and we should be free to do that. And so, <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely. Liberal freedoms, the way many of them conceive today, um, are essential. We've gone over that. Uh, today, I'm sporting this burgundy sweat t-shirt and you've got that wonderful jumper on and we don't want Mao's blue uniform or anything but like come on <laughs> come on <laughs> we, 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 it's, is it mutually exclusive like do we need do we need this interpretation of liberalism to remain sort of free individuals from like those degrees of oppression can we not escape this logic of capitalism while still maintaining these individual freedoms like it's it's it seems like it's yeah one 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 particular the, the freedom to fuck people over oh yeah yeah so like if, if 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 all he's focusing on is this like magic flourishing he's going to and particularly because i don't know where he stood but i assume it was high up in terms of being on the level of the landlords i doubt he was aristocratic i don't know but we're any... yeah, at least at least high socialite I'd imagine. yes he, yeah. he did he did have a an aristocratic friend it was his mentor shaftsbury mm. or something they 
he was going to disregard, and this still isn't bourgeois because that's apparently still quite an urban continental um, class of people. Okay. But his dis, like his clear disregard for all the other tenants who weren't as exciting as this particular tenant, um, the capitalist tenant, uh, just disregarded. And and the, the theory of the theory of property was that if you two phases here that are significant if you could transform the land then you had a right to transform the land and you are not to, a right to claim the land because the theory went yeah. well if if there's 20 people making three carrots a year each well and this one person can make a million carrots then he's increasing the stock for everyone else single-handedly so that that's there that's a better use of land and therefore that person should get get the say scrub the democracy that efficiency deserves okay so so that's so it's still very much pinpointed out or like like missile focused towards uh growth and and you know i guess well probably you know progression but under the guise of growth i suppose or or growth under the guise of progression um so are you, are you referring to like like the sort of the focus now on gdp growth yeah well so yeah so what i'm yeah this this kind of fascination that you're 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 articulating around Locke and saying you know this idea of suddenly hey the freedom here um you know yeah the, the freedom to absolutely expand the land with this incredible new uh go getter attitude <laughs> that's sort of been encouraged um and look this guy will make a million carrots over the three that we had for you know whatever um and but in doing so if if the idea is that it's sorry got the window open sorry i'll close that i'm oh, sorry um the um but if this kind of i guess the the way that freedom is being articulated here like this idea that you know we should all be free to like really embrace this weird incredible progression that's occurring this like this radical explosion of innovativeness use of land growth um but it all still feels yeah really i guess yeah that that's where i feel like i the the word the word freedom there is so loaded because very particular yeah what happens to the freedom of all the other people and and this is the second this the second um wing of that thing then um so that so that first that first um that wing from, i don't know first dimension of the point importantly just as a, as an aside um because it's not necessarily what we're going to get into here but it fully like john locke was used to sort of legitimize with that point colonialism like if get in the americas like if well if the indians aren't doing this thing with this land but we are then we absolutely have the right to to own or claim this land um outright mm. but the second dimension uh that's getting at was um and still in the same breath the producer the direct producer of the land isn't who Locke was talking about when he said oh, okay. that person if that person can then that can enact that frequency if that person can touch that land and make this wonderful thing happen uh, they get the right to it. He was talking about the landlord who, fuck off, wasn't touching the land. You know, the landlord was coordinating the labourers, if even, to to do this. And therefore, the landlord got to, got the extra say. Uh, okay. So, of course, the actual producers who were actually doing the actual production uh, were never going to feature in, in, his, in his concept of freedom. So, yeah, we we need to be free to do this. Meant that us good old boys and our new Paddy Spudhead capitalist um, should be free, morally, technically, uh, legally, to continue this wonderful game. Ah, it's so much fun! Yeah. And every everyone that gets displaced by this new freedom can go fuck themselves. So that is, I mean, where is their freedom? 
you know, essentially, and this is this is fucking socialism here. It's like, well, your your liberty from your liberalism um, is fully smashing all over everyone else who you exclude, who you've decided through your philosophy to exclude from that philosophy. Um, in terms of growth, though, it's a different fetish. Um, I think we might get to it, but in case we don't, the it's the logic of capitalism. The investment you make today, you only get sort of you only get profit if there's expansion the next day. So that's that's why the focus of growth is there. So this okay. this growth this growth is just exciting. This is just like it's not it's not like macro growth. I don't know. That's not necessarily what you were saying, but I think that that is a bit of a difference. It's like um, they're just looking at Locke's just looking at this exciting dynamic without analyzing it to the point that would result in the fetish over GDP growth, which is where all us capitalists have invested all our cash in the system and we're not going to make anything. It was going to be a huge waste of time if we don't see growth in the next year. Okay. So that is the organizational form of production and consumption, um, the social relations of people, and, and that the John Locke thing there totally touches back on that. Of course, the mm-hmm. the social relations of people um, gets quite worse when all of a sudden you, as a tenant, lose your right over a lease or the commons um, that you depended on. And um, yeah, the, like the sort of the, the dehumanizing um, processes in play there. Like you, you, you become less than human when someone powerful is saying we need more freedom, and you've just been kicked off your land, and you have no recourse to gaining it back, and all you've got is your labor to sell. And you've got to leave your family and leave your friends and leave your home village and fuck off to London to live in a fucking slum um, because of this wonderful new freedom that society has found. Um, so this is, this, is the, this is the shift in social relations. Uh, and John Locke being the mental conception of the world, starting to write philosophy. And then this comes back and this is, this is the, this is the codependence and the uneven development between each move um, moment. But in terms of institutional legal and governmental arrangements to the question that you asked a while ago, I know answered, but this is a second round of, of, of where it's impacted is that the judges in ruling um, against appeals to the commons and appeals to customary land use rights and smallholders started quoting John Locke. And saying, yeah, no, your rights, your rights were long-standing and they're valid, and yeah, it's a part of the fabric of society or whatever. Weird legitimization they had. It's amazing that they ever had it at all. Um, all of a sudden, they were like, ah, oh, God gave us all the land, but He also gave us the ability to transform it. So those, this, the, the defendant. <laughs> this guy, the capitalist, um, mm-hmm. he he's doing God's work, and you're just not. So you lose yeah. the right. Um, and so it's in it in its loop in the logic of capitalism as it's as it's going through these mo- mo- moments. Um, it comes back around to other moments again and reinforces its logic. On on it goes. Yeah, I guess um, where where it stops. Necessary. Well, I guess that yeah, that that moment where you start having that that meshing of a something like an abstract, you know, idea. I guess like a philosophy, as it slowly starts to trickle, as it slowly is institutionalized through landowners, but through landowners in a public facing way, um, where these philosophies are being utilized, if 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 only to be seen to be essentially doing this new weird progressive style of business um which obviously will be you know moving its way i guess across 
the land or at least knowledge of it is moving across the land um if finding its way that the mix of the abstract that is the philosophy i guess um manifest through this new form of business by the landowners and a scene of a, a, a seeming progression a newness a freshness um it's it's only um I wasn't going to say it, it's, it's only understandable, but it, it's not. But what I mean is, is like the minute that that makes contact, like with um, law, mm -hmm. then, I mean, I can see how that would be appealing in, in a sort of, I don't know, I guess whatever kind of bizarre field of law that they had then, but this new fresh thing that's appearing and it's, it's come from a thought like, and again, as you said, like if it's starting to, you know, if there's, sort of religious connotations there um you know the way this stuff is kind of like i guess i because i'm not very familiar with Locke's um sort of way he yeah. presented these ideas um but uh the idea that it, it could be like you know hey look you know get, get the landowners on board with this um sorry i'm repeating myself a little bit here but the idea that yeah they would institutionalize this thing and and and, and mobilize it and then if that found its way into the cities and was you know, it's at that point, it's just maybe because of the way information was traveling, then it was just seen as this progressive thing, which I can totally understand uh, uh, courts picking this thing up and going, ah, you know, well, you know, this is the way stuff is Great. being done now. And it does seem, I mean, that guy looks like he's doing pretty well. And I'm all guessing, his mates are doing pretty well. I'm guessing the judge owns a bit of land as well, you know. I'd imagine, I'd imagine so, and he's done pretty well out of it. Um, so yeah, I, I can, it's, it's, yeah, I can, I can totally see how it, it's, as you said, moving its way through those, those various spheres, but then coming back to reinforce whatever, whatever uh, tail it had left there kind of like a yes. game of snake yeah, it's exactly. like oh there's that little bit of the tail left we'll just keep going back around and keep chomping onto the back of it because we'll just keep 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 adding into the keeping the the strand of this whole thing thick exactly you know? i mean you you can Go look Fred. you can look at any moment and you can discuss them in isolation and um and analyze their internal dynamics but exactly um once a law of motion is put in in motion like this um they will they will leave they will leave tails as as they spill over as they as they move along each moment um i mean uh, like so like relations to nature obviously i i assume in it under a feudal system um your as a tenant say your um your relation to nature is is sort of the you you own a small part of nature and you you grow your food and the food that your landlord demands from you um i mean i think that's you can go into other other aspects in feudalism like landlord would obviously his relation of to nature is that everything he sees is his and he can shoot the fucking deer whereas a tenant can't or whatever um yeah, but that's i don't i don't think that's a sort of an interesting uh dynamic in terms of the, the shift from one to the other so the interesting point being the relation to nature of of tenants and the subsistence to competi com competitive production thing is is the key transformation um again the eight tenants living living in close proximity proximity they're looking like i just said they're looking at their land they're the bit of nature that that is relevant to them and they're just growing what they need uh, for themselves and the landlord uh, however once this once this lease market impacts once the competitive production becomes an imperative then all of a sudden that relationship changes and you've got to look at the land uh, look at nature in any way you can to, to all of a sudden you're just like the logic it's the the, 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 the logic and the process i think are the keystones to, to capitalism to understanding capitalism but um you're looking at nature and you're going whether it's the land that you that you have the lease on or whether it's something in the atmosphere just beyond it or within your grasp that you can somehow use 
to give you a competitive advantage. So all of a sudden, the same way that like um, Locke's philosophy shat all over the dispossessed, um, because all of a sudden people saw sh- shitty capitalists, bad capitalists, I was in ineffective capitalists as less than human. Um, you're seeing nature in its commodifying form. And, and of course, once you are dispossessed, in terms of the logic of the system, you are merely a commodity. How can I pay as little as possible to get you to do what I need you to do? Um, how can I buy you in, in the cheapest way possible? The yeah, so back to the relation of nature. Um, how can I use this bit of land or this tree or this plant or this animal to extract this extra cash for their for its exchange value? No longer is it use value; it's the exchange value, and that that's the uh, the logic intertwined with the the competitive aspect. And um, and the relationship, the fucking relationship changes. Um. We did mention your man from the Oxbridge thing last chat, didn't we, two weeks ago? The guy who gave out the nurses looking for a pay rise. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. His view of people is so filtered through the logic of capitalism. He doesn't see people. He doesn't see humans. Like, you don't treat a human like that. If you see a human, you would never fucking treat them in the way that that idiot, like, spoke about those people. So he saw it through the lens of, of capitalism, the relationship between him and those people was not like, not what he would describe as a human relationship. Yeah. As you said, I think, I think, I think the way you sum it up that the term de- dehumanization is perfect. I mean, this, this idea that this new logic you find yourself in, no matter whether it's, you know, I mean, the extremes of say, being uh, to the manner born, so to speak, um, inheriting, you know, uh, some kind of business empire um, and how you view essentially the entire world around you. Like, I know that we've kind of, uh, we've kind of made a joke about it through, through Hollywood as, you know, these films, wherever you find uh, someone who is, comes from a, a well-off a well-off instance and has to f- and finds themselves slumming it slowly. That's always kind of the joke of like, you know, how do they, they don't know how to peel an onion or something fucking benign like that. Yeah. Um, we have that, but then we have all the way down to this instance of someone, a tavern owner, you know, so to speak, like the, the, the same logic applies. And what you could argue is two total opposite ends like two opposite extremes of what you would assume like, or at least what I would assume, um, like I would assume almost like, almost I would actually assume the logic of say the, the fictitious to the manner born kind of individual. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily assume it of say um, a person who had probably come through the various meat grinders that we all do to in uh, and and be driven by that kind of uh, you know that logic of no 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 because i want to be able to own the pub because then you know whether it's i just want to work less or whether i want to just you know skim skim the top i want that bit of money so i can go and do that holiday thing that everyone's doing around me and i'd like to be able to do that too whatever but that that you know, regardless of the extremes, it, it comes off to me as being, yeah, as you said, like the, the, it's a, it's a dramatic change in your relationship with people and objects around you. Um, Everything is commodity. Yeah. And the, it's, it's, it's such a, I guess, a terrifying exhibition of just how sinister the logic can be that if like, you know, someone, again, I'm, I'm making wild assumptions here that this, this guy, um, went through oh, the yeah. grinder to get to the become a pub owner, um, <laughs> but like you know, um, to suddenly that be the way that you relate I, to people is, or things. Yeah, relate to people is 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 fucking terrifying. I mean, like it's not it's not even the case now that we 
you know, well, we're certainly not rich. You know, for people that are just getting by, it's not like that they they literally go through their life assessing the value in terms of exchange of the people that they meet. People no. do people do, do that. But um by and large, people who are just getting by aren't. Um it it's not like we're living in perfect capitalism either where like I don't know. There's, there's not, much, there's not a great access to comp, the, the competition, is there? When you're at the bottom of it, um, yeah. the, um, so there, there is, there is, there is still, and it's not, you know, of course, socialism isn't about like going back to, to, to feudalism, in particular, um, but this, this human moment that sort of that that peasant existence sort of represents it only in relation to what comes afterwards that human existence still still resides we, we're still folk do you know what i mean we still relate to each other in, in human ways and um and i think that that sort of that image as as sort of stylized as it might be um sort of for me is is like is an image to hold on to in terms of imagining the possibilities of socialism because for whatever reasons that like particularly the working class turned against um the the exciting um possibility for a kickstarting of further socialism or a direction in society towards further socialism that corbyn represented for whatever reason that they, that they were turned against that um I believe is in terms of history superficial in terms of now absolutely fucking <laughs> serious as shit um but in terms of like the potential for us to to want to see past these social relations and this logic capital is there the resent that people must feel when they have to come away from from their their folk situation where they see people as people or see things as 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 they are or at least not as commodities like when when people are when people are forced yeah okay sure obviously we resent that we have to sell our our labor like people fucking hate working for fucking corporations that's like as a given and yeah that can be articulated into a wider um vision excuse me and that can then amount to some change, but e- but even in terms of our relationships, it, it not just the the compulsion or the the imperative to have to sell labour. That aside, the way the way we have to relate with each other, um, there, it must cause resent, you know. Um, the conduct of daily life that underpins social reproduction. Reproduction could literally mean having children. It could also mean any service that provides care, or it could mean society's actual replication of itself through all the other above. It's hard to extricate this point from all the others having gone through them. Um, But I think it's like you would immediately relate it to social relations, except social relations is how we relate to one another and not necessarily like how we behave in our daily life. Um, in, in that way, then it might, it, it draws in mental conception of the world. Like, um, excuse me, how we, how we sort of like, like the conduct of daily life, you sort of look at a village and it's walking around and how are you doing Tom? <laughs> that's kind of what i imagine like sort of like how, how people how people are drawing their mental conception and the, the social relations how they're determined all together the, the relation of nature and then how how they're performing that in in their daily life the conduct of daily life and um, how they're channeled by their the, the legal and institutional aspects and um, that, that their parameters um 
yeah it's a it's a hard one to sort of imagine but i suppose maybe it does refer to that image of daily life um in a given moment which i think we have sort of depicted in terms of the transition transition from feudalism to capitalism Mm -hmm. uh, sufficiently Uh, and then the final um moment is uh, labor processes and production of specific goods geographies services or affects Now, I'm not sure what he means by the production of specific goods. I, th- I mean, is it just that? It's just, is it, I mean, maybe maybe that's a bit reductionist here and, and we these things should be taken with more of a, a heavier analytical mind, but I'm just wondering if the production of specific goods is just relating to, <clears throat> I guess, um, rather than just saying, production of goods it's like a, a production of of mm. yeah yeah not not general production the same way as like, it yeah. was meant in the first uh, moment and yeah no, like specific large commodities government. maybe or uh, like just a way of specifying i guess like integral commodities to people like you know highly consumed <laughs> items maybe i don't know um I, I just mean like there's there's general production which was touched on in the first moment and then there's mm. like production of goods uh oh, okay. but production of i mean like well, that would sort of be insinuated by production of services as well i mean if it said mm. goods and services that would be quite clear then also he does say production of geographies and affects as well um uh, you know, I think I'm guessing here maybe specifically because he's talking he says services or affects um, how production like the things and this yeah this this relates I suppose to the specific goods the things that we produce how that's um, how that's distinct from organizational forms of production um, so like the entertainment um, industry will produce affects you know like uh, the way we feel about things and stuff um and geographies then how how i suppose maybe just for the ease of argument here how capitalism sort of produces geographies produces different spaces right um, okay. an, ur- an urban center for instance architect will determine how that space, how that ge- the geography of that space is produced um, through a, a lens, which is either to increase commerce or to increase socialising, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, the logic of capital, obviously, gearing it towards competition. Um, but labour processes, uh, I suppose, is the sort of is the key thing there. Um, labor and production um being being a moment i mean like i suppose when when we th- when we are treating these moments in terms of the feudal system it does um m- maybe uh, maybe they're more collapsed than normally if that makes sense so um you know again we've sort of what w- with what we've gone through in terms of imagining uh, the feudal situation um that we've we've touched on the labor processes and production three carrots <laughs> and 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 tenant tenant farmers so in terms of the transition then the key point is the i suppose the production of wage laborers uh that those displaced by the 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 lease market and the successful competitive capitalist tenants um and I, th- I mean, you know, I think, I think that's, I think having gone through those, well, at least those five moments, but culminating in, in a general picture that does relate to all seven moments, um, we do have a, we do have a, 
a sort of a rough map. Oh, it's always going to be a rough map, but a rough map of um, <laughs> of of how capitalism did arise out of feudalism. How um, just the the particular the particularity of feudalism in England led to that lease market system uh, generating the competitive tenants in the process becoming capitalists um inspiring liberal philosophy theory of property changing social relations changing uh, relations to to property to production um creating creating two new classes out of the peasant body of the capitalist and the um the wage laborer flourishing um cities um which was important actually because what what ramified it and this is this is for point uh, the sixth point the institutional uh, written down point f the institutional legal and governmental arrangements um once the once london became so heavily populated uh, with all this surplus labor the it markets be, can't be, began to be unified so many people needed to be fed that became a national market and this is quite distinct so then so so here we go again we've got like we've already gone through the institutional legal governmental arrangements back in the parliamentary uh, in, in, enclosures on the commons but we're returning to it later down the timeline where um, institutions are changing because a unified national market is occurring because of the population of surplus labor and the surplus production being sent to um, being sent to to feed them because obviously they're not bloody growing food in town um, is, is, is quite significant in terms of enforcing this capitalist logic through all the different moments um, and instituting it as a system um yeah and then of course of course eventually you get to the point that um the political and the economic are separated um so sufficiently that that you're you're coming to um you're coming towards the the mature nation state uh where the the landlord body the landlord class is is managing the internal economic production um the state no longer the state's taken the, the the monopoly on on coercion enforcing the new property relations um and it that no longer that no longer is the job of of landlords and you you're not getting the feudal system one of the distinctions is like this your landlord isn't isn't this brutal figure who's going to coerce you into um you giving them what he wants yeah i'm sure that happens but like the, our image of feudalism and modernity uh is sort of hinged on on that transition another mm. another moment there is is surpassed again and um once that happens England as a nation state with this thriving, efficient, competitive market is coming then to bear on other countries. Um, it's, you know, it's the time of exploration and colonialism and all of a sudden there's all this extra, extra uh, wage laborers and innovations and wealth all combining to improve and expand military and expeditionary um capacities and um mm -hmm. you, you know you're you're sort of france and germany and stuff are looking like netherlands um shit we need to get our act together and the competition is becoming international then um and on it goes on it spirals is the point there um yeah that each each moment that they i mean you're just you're just verging closer and closer then to our our current situation by um by examining 
each moment in turn and not necessarily again in in, in sequence but um mm. the uh it, i don't know it, it's like it's like a loop every time it goes round each each moment is enhanced that that further and reinforcing that logic and i think um yeah it's like 3d chess no it's like rather like they're all kind of they're all sort of permeating each other like in every direction um and i think actually you, you said it you said it really well there like the idea that it's it's a loop it's 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 always um feedbacking back into each individual like any time something is you know passing through the logic is passing passing through and establishing itself or it's or in further in yeah further entrenching itself in 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 one of those moments whether it's up down left or right back forward through time and space um it'll sort of yeah work its way back back into the other ones to consistently reaffirm itself and re-entrench itself reaffirm is it like you know that's that's yeah. sort of um that's very much it like it's like um if if you've got something if if one if one moment's kicked off one a certain sort of reaction then like it there's there's a seductivity because because people are being compelled to because of the competitive aspect of it because of the real life and death sort of situation um that it sort of ushers in um you got a situation that someone with any sort of modicum of power in the next moment obviously they're not that compartmentalized in in reality i mean they can be i suppose but generally speaking we're, we're talking quite in the abstract here um they're they're going to sort of do their best because of that compulsion because of the competition because of the seductiveness of you know the the, the both the negative and the positive sides of things are compelling people in other spheres of of society to to um facilitate it uh, and and in a different way so if, if if you go through all seven you, you start with the first one and the, the person in the next moment goes oh shit we've got to do this um and you get you get through all moments and you come back around hypothetically stylistically to to the initial moment then things have in society generally have advanced so much that they've got to they'll be going oh okay now we've got to take it this step further in whatever direction and um and yeah i think um in examining that process in in our loose our loose fashion here we've um we've given ourselves a, a sort of a platform uh, for a sort of a framework for a theory of change, which was Harvey's idea, the co-revolutionary theory. Um, and I think he, he sort of, by outlining this framework, he emphasizes the need to recognize the interconnection between them and how often we, how often a social movement can, can pick a point and of course, social movements need to specialize because they're expressing their their moment. Uh, mm -hmm. They're expressing their subjugation, their oppression, and no one no one can do it better than those experiencing that issue. Um, but to to sort of to get wise that moment, as we sort of described it when we were talking about, oh, we didn't do it in this series that we was hegemony and socialist strategy, the. Um, Orthodox Marxism, the, the initial proletariat movement, working class oh, yeah, movement. Yeah, to, yeah. You know, they like we're not going to come preach to you and get you on board. You're going to have to become us to come on board. Um, so that's obviously um, a moment, but failing to appreciate how all the other moments are interrelated and necessary to push change forward. Um, so yes, that's why it's co-revolutionary. Um, many revolutions must incur for us to, uh, to get, to get out of this, to get out of this compulsion. Um, like, like when it's framed in that way it just it seems such a difficult it, it, at one level it seems like 
we we are mental society is this is just madness there's no reason to do this let's just stop wow. it's like i think i think it was recorded when we we're talking about gdp growth it's like well you've got all this stock investment not stock in the stock market but like it stocked up investment um yeah. and that and imbuing from what we've been talking about of course or not imbuing but coming from um having been imbued by what we've been talking about um so the logic has transformed so much and not so much like the competition or the competition compels me to improve my situation to become more efficient to that competition has led me to invest my surplus wealth into something and now we need to improve that in order for me to gain my return um whereas it's just like stop <laughs> you know so there's mm. so there's that simple side of things just like fucking all we have to do is step away but the other the other side of it is just thinking like when when that compulsion is there how how do we how how is that how's the power of its logic undone um the thing the thing that people have to lose to sacrifice not not the majority of the people by any means i'm sure but um those people with i mean the more the more they have invested in it most likely the more power that they have in society um how do we get them to stop but i mean that's that's what we're going to look at next week or in two weeks time i wonder just as like a just on the back of that i wonder like in the same way that you, for example, and I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm discrediting an, an awfully large amount of people, but I know an awful lot of people who are uh, really doubling down on things like cryptocurrencies, but without an investing, and by which I mean like they're, they're putting savings into this stuff, but they self-admittedly don't fully understand it because they don't see a need to. It, it can remain an abstract uh, uh, concept to them because there are specialists who are either advising or whatever. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I wonder if the same thing works when you start going further up the chain more into the kind of stock that you're, you know, the stock investment that you're talking about with mm-hmm. regards to like these large, um, like I would always assume people, do, like, I mean, I guess this is a, a condition or a hangover from, I guess being told this when I was younger, um, that you know people dealing with these like vast amounts of like you know the the, the point at which you know m- money is not it's not it, not what it we stops think being it is. the way that we can cons- you and I might conceive yeah. of money. It's conceived off in a very different light, um, and I wonder you know is is the logic actually something that's fully like is is the logic something that is kind is is understood at that level or or is it also at that point like um so what i mean is like just to simplify it is that like if you're at that level um you know of that kind of you know within that system of you know accumulation and and re reinvestment and, and profiteering, uh, basically, you know, like the capitalist class, um, how much of it, if any of it, could be put in the same category as I'm saying about the, the people investing? Like, like, is there ever a point where it's, it's, even though they're investing, they still don't fully understand the system themselves? It's still yeah. an abstract because because there's another specialist another level up that's kind of explicitly saying to them no 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 because this is this is the piston like you've got to keep keep this thing otherwise the whole thing falls apart it's it's a game isn't um, it and it's it's it, it was a game then it's still a game now like it's 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 the excite it's the excitement it's like it's like um a, a slow played out version of being in a casino or no well the casino was a fast played out version of capitalism it's like the excitement of putting in an investment taking a risk and seeing a return is exciting um gambling whatever and like john locke like john locke didn't understand this compulsion he just saw this exciting return on Mm. investment He, he pressed a button and something came out like um 
and I don't know, did Adam Smith understand that? I, I haven't read Adam Smith, but I don't think he did. Did Ricardo? I'm not sure. Classical economists like um, Karl Marx. That's pretty much it. And unless, like, whatever the 20th century has done, it's, like, produced this stigma. And I think there's two takes that are parallel. It's those that don't understand this situation but swallow the stigma of Marxism and don't want to understand. Um, or there are those that do understand or, and are terrified of that truth being revealed and, uh, mm. and, and are doing their best to subdue it. Um, one's obviously more powerful than the other because one of them is, one of them knows the fucking score and the other is a fucking idiot. Um, but that's that's one there is literally the, the hangover our, of aristocracy in our society and the other is reaction the reactionary um base and yeah i don't know in terms of i, th- I think that's where people are at in terms of knowing and, and remember it was it's, the capitalists aren't the aristocracy and this kind of links back to the end of our conversation two weeks ago it's like well in terms of growth if there is none, if there's none forecast, and Harvey in Enigma makes the point, actually, I forgot that he did this, that to replicate itself, to, to keep the system going, you need 3% growth every year for that logic to continue, for, for that return on investment to generally be, be made. And um, Oh, yeah, no, this was mentioned in, in the articles as well, yeah. Um, and um, if that's not happening... Like I said, this brings it back to what I was saying at the end of the last chat. What's happening with, with the capitalists? Like, is, 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 is Bezos a capitalist at this stage? Where's he getting his return? I mean, is, it, is his return coming from extra economic situations here? So this the, the, the thing with feudal lords was that they weren't getting their return or they weren't getting their surplus wealth. They weren't collecting, mm. extracting the surplus wealth through economic means. It was through extra economic means. So if there's no growth, but Amazon is booming, what's where's that growth coming from? Acquisitions from other companies, maybe, but only in mm. a limited, limited way. So is mm. is he anticipating that? And is he about to, like, is he preparing not to become, is he declining his investment from the system and preparing to not be a capitalist, to have the wealth and to use the, the wealth as endemic in his family now? Um, oh, okay. So, so like completely privatize the, the wealth that he's accumulated and just go, yeah, there we go. It, it doesn't move it's now yeah i guess re going back to the the yeah the sort of nature of i guess yeah feudal lordism like where everything was passed down no of course like i mean well, that, it, i mean that, that even came that even came afterwards that, that's just the pre-victorian standard sure sorry but, yeah but, well but i think but of course yeah of course like it is feudalism as well but 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 the other sort of more profound point and we touch on this with, with the chat with Stephen, is is his investments is the surplus wealth that he's generating not merely being like like the reason where the reason there's a downturn is because people took their capital out of the system just like in 1930s yeah those with wealth ran the banks for their gold and stuff and people who would generally invest in capitalism um want to want to skip town because because there's the fear rings out among the crowd and like a field of rabbits and down the burrows they go. Um, but is the other thing that a company like Amazon is doing, like we know Facebook is doing, is it, um, is it investing in the more brutal coercive side of things, developing technologies of, um, of control? Uh, and again, well, do, this is not to go down the, the way of... Um, conspiracy theories <laughs> but like 
it's a question. Um, if if there's no growth, is Bezos as a capitalist? Is he taking his cash and running and just becoming a like a like a a landed baron, or is he doing it in a more profound sense? By um, is is there still growth in in that sort of um, technological development? And is that is that where they can go? Is that where capitalists can go? Uh. Yeah, because I think uh, if I recall correctly, the yeah the last the last uh, one of the plausible kind of directions that we discussed in the last chat was um, you know what's the next extent of power I guess that one would be one would gravitate towards and obviously the you know cultural touchstone nowadays is well you become the president. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, like you just start being in charge of the like you just skip out the John Locke and you just go straight into running the laws yourself if, and you, if, you well, write the that, law that's yourself what they did. That, that is what they did the 1688 revolution is like they took the parliament mm. and started writing the laws themselves oh yeah but I guess if, yeah yeah you did so. but if you, if you are John Locke and, it, and you are now and you're a billionaire and you see the game running to an end it's like oh I've there's no return to my investment. Where, what, where do you put it? What do you do? How do you extend the game? Yeah, being the president would be a lot of fun for a short while. And then... <laughs> yeah, then I guess you start actually having to do something. Um, <laughs> sec- second year is where they actually start asking you to do shit, I imagine. Um, hmm. No, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, with regards to yeah, <laughs> if there's if uh, if there's no growth, do you just do you just as you said take your gold out of the bank and start putting it in the mattress, and then but then you 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 privatize that that becomes something that is in theory untouchable. Look um, at the way look at the way workers are being treated in Amazon. It's fucking hmm. disgusting. Like that, that's, that's what I was getting at earlier. Sorry. It's extra economic at this stage. 